Well, good morning, everyone. Once again, welcome to Journey. It is great to be together this morning. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Miranda Stout. I get to serve here at Journey as the worship coordinator. And I'm really excited to be here with you as we close out our series in the book of Matthew. So as we start, I'd love to just tell you a quick story. So when I was probably 15 or 16 years old, I was a sophomore in high school, and I had the opportunity to go on my very first mission trip to Haiti. I was so excited for this trip. It was going to be my first time on a plane. It was going to be my first time just really immersing myself in a different culture, especially in, a, in an impoverished country like Haiti. So my dad had previously gone to Haiti multiple times before, so he was prepping me on anything and everything that I could potentially lay my eyes on. So we got all packed up, we got ready to go, took my first plane ride, and we got to Haiti, and it was an incredible, life-changing experience for me. We got the chance to love on some people, share with them the love of Christ. We got to help paint and build a school they were hoping to open. Part of our team was able to go to uh, different remote villages in Haiti and help them fix water wells, which really were these people's source of life. And it's, it's a sad story because people would come and purposefully destroy these wells so that people had to walk miles and miles and miles and miles just to get clean and fresh water. So, so our team was able to go fix these wells, and not only that, but teach people how to fix these wells. It was an incredible experience for me. And you know, seeing the brokenness, seeing real life poverty, people who truly did not know where their next meal was coming from. Not only that, but mothers who didn't know where to take their sick babies or their sick kids. Not only that, but but witnessing those same exact people get up and worship Jesus in a way that I've never experienced before, that was the biggest thing for me. It was life-changing. Because 16-year-old Miranda, I have to be honest, was selfish. Okay, I had my priorities in the wrong places. Uh, I cared way too much about what people thought of me. In fact, before going to Haiti, I was getting ready to go to prom. Okay, so I had an upperclassman that had asked me to go to prom. I was so excited. I had to find the perfect dress, and I had to do it before going to Haiti because prom was shortly after. So we went on this shopping trip for my prom dress, and I don't know why, but my entire family came with me. So my younger siblings, my younger brother, my younger sister, my dad, my mom, I don't remember a whole lot of that experience. I think I blocked it out because it was truly traumatic. But I do know that by the end of this shopping trip, my whole family I would say hate is probably a strong word, but they strongly disliked me, were extremely irritated with me. And needless to say, I did not find my perfect prom dress before going to Haiti. So coming back from Haiti, I was so changed that I just told my mom, I don't even care. I don't care what I wear to prom. I'll wear my pajamas. There are bigger things happening in the world than me finding the most perfect prom dress. It was life-changing, truly life-changing. And this was really when the Great Commission, which which is what we're going to learn about today, Jesus' last words in the book of Matthew, this is when the Great Commission became so real to me. So real that I actually got the words, therefore go, tattooed on my foot during this time. I was sold out for Jesus. I was sold out for the Great Commission, just ready to share the love of Christ with people. But looking back at this experience in my life, I think that 16-year-old Miranda missed the boat just slightly, just slightly. My heart was in the right place. My intentions were in the right place. I wanted to share the love of Christ with people. But coming back from Haiti, I was so focused on being in Haiti that I think I missed out on opportunities to live out the Great Commission right where I lived, in Mount Pleasant, Michigan. Don't get me wrong, I am all for international missions, right? Caleb just talked about the team coming back from Nicaragua, having some similar experiences. Like I said, this trip was, was pivotal for me in my life, but, but I so badly wanted to be somewhere else. I didn't realize, oh, I can live the Great Commission right where I live. 
So as we take a look at what Jesus says about this, let's jump in to this passage. This is Matthew 28. We're going to read starting in verse 16. It says this, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So in this passage, when Jesus was commissioning his disciples, he had already been sacrificed. So we know and we believe that God sent his son, Jesus, to be born of a virgin, to live on earth, to sacrifice himself for us, to literally beat death, go from death to life, and to live in relationship with these disciples. Shortly after that, he ascends back into heaven. So, so this, this time is right in between. It's, it's post-resurrection and pre-ascension, okay? Can you imagine being alive during this time? Can you imagine what that's like witnessing one of the most incredible miracles of human history? This guy, Jesus, was their resurrected king, the savior of the world, not just the savior of the world in that time period, but the savior of the world for forever, for eternity. And these disciples are, are witnessing this happen, and not only that, but they're talking to the guy that did it. They're talking to Jesus. They're walking with him. They're learning from him and growing from him, learning his ways. And he's basically saying to them, now go and talk about it. Go and share everything that you just learned. How, how could they not, right? How could they not? Now if we fast forward to 2023, today's August 27th, 2023. No matter how long you've been following Jesus, maybe it's days, weeks, months, maybe it's been your whole life. For some reason, it's so easy to forget that Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, his story is just as true now, it's just as true today as it was back then. Jesus didn't just die for those people back then, but he died for you and he died for me so that we can live in eternity with him, and, and that's a big deal. That's a story that's worth sharing. In fact, the Great Commission, as followers of Jesus, the Great Commission, it's not just a suggestion. It's really a command. For those of us who are followers of Jesus, he is commanding us to share his story and to share his love with the world, not just because he likes to tell us what to do, right? No, that's not why. It's because he loves the world. He loved those people back then. He loves us now. He loves everyone in between. He wants people's lives to be changed forever. So the question is, how, how do we do this? How do we make disciples? Let's take a look at what the definition of a disciple is. Webster's definition says this. It's a pupil or a follower of any teacher or school. A true disciple is not just a student or a learner, but a follower, one who applies what he has learned. I'm going to read that last sentence one more time. A true disciple is not just a student or a learner, but a follower, one who applies what he has learned. So what does that mean for us as we follow Jesus? We are to follow in the leadership and the lifestyle of who he was, following in his ways and following his guidance and direction, digging into his word and not just keeping it as head knowledge, but truly living out what he tells us to do. And not just the easy things that make us feel all warm and fuzzy in our hearts, right? We are to follow all of his commandments, even the hard things. And we do that because we, we truly trust him. So before I even continue on, I want you to ask yourself today, are you a disciple? Are you a disciple? Not just are you a Christian, not are you a follower of Jesus, not do you believe in God, do you believe in his story, but are you actively following in the ways of Jesus? Have you allowed the story of Jesus to change your life? So many of us call ourselves Christians, 
but are we actually embodying what it means to be a true disciple, applying what we know to our lives? We don't just take the good news of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection and say, sweet, that's cool. I believe that that happened. That's an awesome story. I'm just going to keep living life the way I want to. No, a true disciple allows the story of Jesus to change their lives. We live like we are made new. We live like we have been, been set free. We live like Jesus sacrificed himself so that we could live in eternity with him. Are you a disciple? And I ask this question, I think this question is so important because I believe that in order to make disciples like Jesus is telling us to do, we first need to actually be a disciple of Jesus. We need to become a disciple of Jesus. So going back to that first question, how do we do this? How do we make disciples? If we've established that we need to become disciples, we need to embody who Jesus was to the best of our ability, naturally, when that happens, we begin to stand out. Okay, people that we are around might even begin to wonder, why do we have so much joy? Or why in tough situations do we have peace? Why can we, how can we love people who might be, might be difficult to love? Jesus actually gives us some really specific word pictures that relates directly to this. In Matthew 5, starting in verse 13, it says this, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Salt and light, right? These two things that are distinct. These two things that when we experience them, we, we know without a shadow of a doubt that it's salt and it's light right? As followers of Jesus, we are called to be different. And I read somewhere that we are to be defined by our love for God and our love for each other. When people look at us, that's what they should see. That's part of being salt and light. One person that I, I'm really learning this from is actually from my husband, David. So some of you might know David. He works in the corporate world, and he comes across a lot of different types of people, People from different walks of life, different belief systems, different ways of doing life, people from all over the world. And it's really not uncommon in any given environment that David is in for someone to come up to him and say, there's something different about you. There's something different about you. And maybe that relates to him as a person or the, it relates to the way he does business or does things. Um, what they think and, and what is very true is that David is very smart. He's really creative. He comes up with really cool things and he makes things happen. And all of that is so true about my husband. But what we know is that he stands out and he's different because he is filled with the Holy Spirit. And not just that, but he actually has allowed God to mold him and shape him, to, to control every step that he, he makes and, and every word that he speaks. He has allowed Jesus to make him into the man that he is. And maybe you can relate to that. Maybe someone has said that about you as a follower of Jesus. It's salt and light. We can all be salt and light in our homes, in our workplaces, at the grocery store, in any given situation. So now if we look back at how Jesus made disciples, it's really clear that he kept things fairly simple. Not only was Jesus a guy that stood out to people, he was salt and light, but he didn't just stay in his corner. He lived life with people. He lived in relationship with people, and that's really the next step. First, we become a disciple of Jesus. And next, we live in relationship with those around us. And as we do that, we get the opportunity to be light to people, serving them, loving them, and sharing Jesus' love with them. Because the truth is that in these relationships that we're in, people really are watching everything that we do, right? And I don't mean that in a creepy way. 
But maybe if you can think about someone that you look up to, maybe it's a friend or a coworker or a family member, maybe it's an older, wiser mentor, you want to be like them, right? I remember being, being a young kid and having people I look up to. Maybe it was a celebrity or an actress or even someone in my own school. I wanted to look like them. I wanted to walk like them, talk like them, dress like them. I wanted my mannerisms to be like them. I wanted to be them, right? And really, I'm learning the other side of this through my own kids, Okay, so I have a two and a half year old named Mila and a seven month old named Olivia. And I am quickly learning that Mila is soaking in everything that I do. Okay, and maybe those of you who are parents can, can relate to that. From how I interact with people to how I respond to situations that make me happy or sad or angry or frustrated, to how me and David interact with each other, even to the point of how I treat my own dog, okay? Some of you might know Ned. He's a little bit crazy. And so I always know when, when I have yelled at Ned too much in a day because Mila starts pointing her finger at him and yelling at him as well. I remember the first time that I, that I heard Mila say something that I really didn't want her to say. I think I caught her off guard for some reason, and all of a sudden she looks at me and says, oh my gosh. And I said, oh no, she is taking in everything that I'm saying, even my voice inflections, how dr dramatizing I, I say things. Everything that I do, she soaks in, and I think it's the same with adults and in the relationships that we are in. I'm becoming more and more convinced that how we make disciples is more about how we, living, how we live our own lives instead of how we're telling others to live their lives. I'm going to say that one more time. I'm becoming more and more convinced that making disciples is more about how we live our own lives than how we tell others to live their lives. And as we continue to, to think about how Jesus made disciples, we come to find out that these relationships that we are in are really just the context of disciple making. If life with people is truly a priority in our lives, which I believe that it should be, we can quickly realize that disciple making doesn't happen on Facebook or Instagram, right? Social media can be a start to that, but 95% of the time, True disciple-making does not happen over social media. It doesn't happen on a street corner when you're condemning someone for the way that they're living. It doesn't happen even when you're telling someone how to live their lives. Where it happens is when you're seated next to someone. It happens over breakfast or over coffee. It happens when you invite another mom friend over to your house and your kids are running around like crazy wild animals and you can barely get a word into each other. But you're in proximity to each other. You're watching how each other does things. It happens when you sit down and, and you read the Bible with your kids. It happens when you, when you pray with your spouse at the end of the day. It happens when you, when you get to the chance to encourage a friend or a coworker who's going through a crisis. Disciple-making happens, and disciple-making begins in relationship with one another. These relationships that we have begin to open the door to some really cool opportunities to speak into each other's lives, to encourage one another, to call out giftings and callings and anointings. And just as there was something unique about each of those 12 disciples back then, there's something unique about each and every one of us now. And as we start to figure that out in our own lives, we get the awesome opportunity to partner with God in cultivating the anointing in other people's lives. Beginning relationships with people is just the start and just the open door to that. In fact, part of the Great Commission actually talks about this. The rest of verse 20 says, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. We can do that by helping people see what that looks like with their specific giftings and callings. And not just do we have the opportunity to call that out in other people, but it's up to us to allow people to call that out in us, to allow people to disciple us. Part of being a disciple is not just making disciples. 
but allowing yourself to be discipled as well. So ultimately, ultimately, it really starts with how we live our own lives. As followers of Jesus, we have the opportunity to live in the fruits of the Spirit, being salt and light, being defined by the love of God, and being a light that shines bright enough that people begin to wonder what's so different about us. We get to live in relationship with people, doing life together, sharing the gospel and the love of Jesus with those around us. So here are just three simple statements to help us remember what living out the Great Commission in our own lives might look like. The first is this, live as a disciple of Jesus yourself. Allow Jesus to change your life and say yes to him first. So a question you could ask yourself once again, are you a disciple of Jesus? Have you already said yes to him? And if your answer is yes, is there someone that you need to ask to disciple you as we are all striving to grow and to learn together? And the next statement is this, model what it means to live a Jesus-centered life. Allow people to watch how you live your life for Jesus, living in the fullness of his freedom, grace, and truth. And a question you could ask yourself here is, does your life model what it means to live as a disciple? What are your thoughts? What are you thinking about? What are your actions say? Do your words embody who the person of Jesus is? Does your life model who Jesus is? The last one is this, is just to simply lead to lead others in doing the same thing that you're doing. Encourage people to live in the ways of Jesus, recognizing that his spirit is with us always. A question you could ask yourself here, is there someone in your life, even, even think about this week, think about this week, is there someone in your life that you can encourage or share the gospel with? Remembering that the Great Commission isn't just a suggestion, but it truly is a command for those of us who are his followers. We have all that we need to partner with Jesus in this mission of making disciples. Be encouraged in the fact that we don't have to have pressure on ourselves to have the perfect message or all the answers to life's questions or the perfect words or actions to say to someone in need. All we have to do is say yes to Jesus first and walk through his open doors He will provide us with the words and the actions and more opportunities to share his love with people. As we close out today, I just want to read the second half of verse 20. It encourages us in this, and these are the last words of the book of Matthew. Jesus says, And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus is always walking with us. He never leaves us. Let's find comfort in that. Let's find strength in that. And let's be confident in who Jesus is and share his love with the world.